Hello ladies and gentlemen, Richard here, the creator of the Top Pack Gaming Man channel. Today I have decided that I'm going to do a little Patreon Q&A video where I answer questions from my fine patrons. With regards to my patrons who donate to me over on Patreon, there are only 61 of you. However, the 61 of you make a huge difference to my life in that you make up a large percentage of the revenue in which this channel generates. So. Because of you, 61 people, you give me the motivation to upload videos which mostly get tens of thousands of views. So because of you, 61 people, you're actually helping me entertain tens of thousands of people. That's how much of a difference you are making. You're not just making a difference to making my life easier, you're also helping me make content to entertain that huge abundance of people. So thank you so much for being so generous to not only me, but to all of the viewers of this channel. It's absolutely amazing. I could not be more thankful. So, now it's time for a little bit of a reward for you. Where I will answer some of your questions in this video. So, if you too would like to become a patron of this channel and get involved with these Patreon Q&As, then you can support me and my channel for as little as $1 a month over on Patreon, and then you are helping to provide entertainment for tens of thousands of people. What an amazing service, thank you. So, my first question is from a gentleman known as Phil Cave, and he says, Great to hear about your plans to go full time with YouTube. When you are traveling, I assume that you will have your lovely wife and baby hat with you. Will the Lady Decade channel continue to release content as well as assist you? How in God's name will you both cope with the traveling work and looking after the little one? Now that's an absolutely great question, Phil, because it gives me the opportunity to give people a little bit more insight into the goings on behind the scenes of everything I do. So the first part of that question, it says, when you are traveling, I assume that you will have your lovely wife and baby hat with you. Yes, that is definitely the case. Both of those people will be traveling with me for time. And the reason as to why I'm doing this is because not only is this going to help me out greatly, but more importantly, it's going to give them a better life as well. I'm a family man at the end of the day, and I put family above everything else, and I always will do so. Currently, I work on this YouTube channel almost full time, as you probably noticed with the amount of uploads. But on top of that as well, I've got a full time um, 50 plus hour a week job on top of that as well, which is a professional position. So that eats up a lot of my time and concentration. Now, obviously, because I'm putting in this ridiculous amount of hours with my professional position and YouTube on top of that, the time I get to spend with my family is a lot more limited than I would like it to be. So going full time on YouTube will hopefully allow me to spend the time I would like with my family. So whilst I'm traveling, say for example now on, on an average week, I'll probably put out about 12 hours a week into my YouTube content I would say. So if I triple that to 36 hours a week, in theory, I would hopefully triple the revenue I would make, but not only that, I would free up a ridiculous amount of time compared to what I have now, which instead, I'll be able to spend with my wife and baby, which is all anyone really wants at the end of the day. Well, it's what I want at least. So they will definitely be coming with me, and thanks to YouTube and all of your help watching my videos, I'll actually be able to be a dad who's around a lot more than the majority of fathers. So really really thank you for that it's amazing so yes of course they will definitely be with me the next part of your question it says will lady decade continue to release content as well as assist you and of course once we are traveling and i have more free time i'll have more time to assist her because obviously with me being at work so much at present most of her time is obviously used up with having to look after my son as she would want and what i would want and what anyone else would want so as you can see as my son is getting older and older he's six months old now she's actually producing less and less content because he's becoming more demanding um, the older he gets as to be expected really but once i'm free um, a lot more free than i am now I will be able to take um, an equal workload when it comes to raising our son. So therefore, she will have some time freed up where she'll be able to make more content than she is uploading now. 
Now for the third part of your question, how in God's name will you both cope with traveling, work and looking after the little one? I feel like I've already answered quite a lot of that within this question, but also ridiculously with this whole situation, by traveling, I will be financially better off and so will the rest of my um, little family unit as well. Because at the moment, with her being off looking after the child, I'm the sole breadwinner in this household. And her channel is only small, it's not being monetized in any capacity yet. And with uh, the UK being such an expensive country, and obviously with having a mortgage as well, everything that I earn in my professional position is being eaten up straight away with the mortgage, the household bills, car insurance, phone contracts, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on, as we all know. So if my professional position is just eating up um, all of the money I generate um, and putting it back into this house, it just makes a lot more sense with renting the place out, which is what I'm going to be doing. And once that's rented out, I will not have very much at all in the way of bills. So, if we are traveling around countries such as Thailand, Romania, etc., the cost of living in those countries is extremely cheap and it's the ideal sort of uh, environment for YouTubers such as myself to flourish because not only will I have the low cost of living, but the fact that I work remotely from this laptop will free me up to essentially allow me to be able to travel anywhere I want in theory. And if I do run into any financial difficulties, I look to be making regular trips back to the United Kingdom anyway, and I'll be looking to take on agency work to keep up my CPD, because let's be honest, this whole YouTube thing in all likelihood will not last forever. I quite frankly find it absolutely bizarre that the majority of full-time YouTubers seem to put all of their eggs into this little basket and just kind of hope it will last forever. Because in reality, that's not going to be the case, is it? But I am going to take this Goldilocks zone in terms of uh, time to take up this opportunity to be able to work remotely from a laptop and enjoy time with my family whilst traveling the world. What could be more fulfilling than that at the end of the day? So, uh, a big question. I hope I've cleared up a lot of what you uh, wanted me to answer within this question. If anyone else has got any questions, then feel free to interact with me about it in the comments section. So, I'm going to cut the camera now and move on to the next one because I had a lot to say there. The next question is from Mark S. Hines and he says, do you own and or play a BitCorp game mate? I own one and several games for it. I bought it on eBay from someone in Australia. So Mr. Hines, not yet. I do not own a game mate. However, I would like to procure one very shortly as obviously that's the ideal piece of hardware for me to take and play and review on my handhelds around the world series, which I am looking to resume as of July the 24th of this year when I go full time traveling again. Obviously, as some of the viewers at home will be aware, I've already covered the Megaduck on this channel before and the Waltara Supervision, two very similar handhelds. So the Game Mate would be the perfect follow up video to those sort of systems, really. So, yes, I do really want a Game Mate and I would love to cover it on here but I do not own one yet but it's in the pipeline that's what I can say. Question from Ben Jackson. Oh no, due to a cataclysmic event the UK government is requisitioning all retro games and equipment for their own nefarious needs but despite this highly unlikely and unusual event the government agents are going to allow you to keep two consoles and two games for each from your collection. What will you choose? Oh God, there's so many bloody systems, aren't there, that it's pretty tough to just pick one or two. Um, so I'm allowed to keep two systems with two games for each. Okay, so really it's got to be games you can get a lot of playtime out of. So what you can do a lot of different things with. So first of all, I'm going to save a Nintendo 3DS with um, Pokemon Sun and Moon, or Pokemon Sun or Moon for it. Um, those games are absolutely huge, and there's obviously over 700 different Pokemon to collect within them. On top of that as well, there's a ridiculous amount of different play modes to do, the story mode, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of different things you can do with Pokemon, all different ways in which you can play the same game. So if I want to get a lot of play time out of one game, it's going to be a Pokemon Sun or Moon game. And once again, um, for the same system, for the 3DS. Hmm, what could I, else could I have on the 3DS? Ah, 
Another one, what just given me a ridiculous amount of playtime, Xenoblade Chronicles. My all time favourite JRPG, I would say. The Wii version's amazing, but you can also get it on the 3DS. So it's a good 80 hours to have just one playthrough, and then there's a, there's a new game plus on there as well. So, yep, yeah, 3DS for Pokemon Sun or Moon and Xenoblade. Uh, Xenoblade 3D to be more specific, and I suppose a second system. Let's have a little think here. What would I go for? What else can I get a lot of time out of? It's difficult, isn't it? It's a really tough question. Well done. Okay, I would say a Game Boy Advance as well, because I do love my handhelds, as you probably have realised with my handhelds around the World Series. And first game on that, I would like an original Game Boy copy of Tetris, because again, this is addictive as hell, and there's just... Uh, you can get a lot of time and enjoyment out of that game and I've never ever ever got bored of Tetris You can just keep playing it over and over again and another game for the same reason very addictive And I've never completed it all the way through because there's just so much content in the game I'm going to say Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising uh, which is on the Game Boy Advance itself Again, that's just games that you could pump so much time into. It's basically chess on steroids. A fantastic strategy RPG. So there's my persistence. 3DS, Game Boy Advance, and the games being Tetris, Pokemon Sun and Moon, Xenoblade, 3D, and Advance Wars 2. So here's a question from Synth Spaces over in Australia. Good day, mate, to you. Does it irk you that in 2040 there be a generation of gamers getting misty-eyed about playing Fortnite? Uh, that's just the progression of time, isn't it? Um, we're getting older and older and the older we get, um, the more out of touch we will get with general society and it will be more difficult for us to relate to the youth of yesteryear. And Fortnite is an, a perfect example of that, a game which um, the youths of today absolutely worship, whilst people such as myself and others just don't really get it at all. Like when you've played 3,000 plus games over your lifetime, it's quite difficult to see what these kids see what's so special particularly about Fortnite and that's before we even go into the ethics of the whole thing with regards to the game's addictions, its microtransactions and all the stuff like that really. The fact that the game's not really suitable for children to begin with yet they all play it anyway. And even uh, the great Prince Harry himself has um, recently said that he thinks the game needs to be banned, which has made him even more um, in favour of becoming my favourite royal. However, he's got to do a lot of work yet to surpass um, anything what Prince Philip has done in the past. Question from Edward James Bennett. Do you think so-called retro games are overrated? And any idea why people seem obsessed with them? I own a Japanese Sega Saturn, but I have absolutely no interest in owning Pan's Dragoon Saga. Now again, that's a bit of a double question. You've got two question marks there. The first part says, do you think so-called rare games are overrated? See, it really does depend, doesn't it, from one game to the next. In terms of the value in which people are willing to pay for these games, um, if we're talking about for the play experience itself, then yes, I would say they are definitely overrated. But a lot of these games are so expensive due to the fact that they were uh, produced in limited quantity and the fact that the games themselves are absolutely fantastic. So are games like Pan's Dragoon Saga and Earthbound fantastic games? Absolutely, they really are. And in the past, when I was heavily into my collecting, I procured box copies of both of those games. Um, so yes, they are too expensive for what they are, but if that's what people are willing to pay, that's what people are willing to pay, I suppose. I've mentioned it on the past in this channel as well that it seems to be people buy these expensive games not really just to play them, but a lot of them are trying to fill holes within their life because the majority of people are stuck in 40 plus hour a week jobs they don't like, they get a limited amount of holiday and they get all this money coming in every single month and they've got nothing to do with it other than waste it on absolute crap like expensive games. It's almost a way of healing the wounds from wasting one's existence. That's certainly what I felt I used to do in the past anyway. However, um, as I am getting older, um, I'm starting to discover better and better ways of playing games. So whilst I did spend £120 on a complete copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga in the past, a PAL copy, I have now procured an NTSC copy as well, which I have just simply 
burnt the game onto discs, discs which cost me 20 pence each. So now I can play an NTSC copy on my Japanese Saturn um, using the pseudo Saturn exploit. So yes, there are certainly more productive ways of playing these old amazing games without having to fork out the outrageous costs for the games on original cartridges or CDs. So yes, the second part of your question, and any idea why people seem obsessed with them? Once again, like I said, I believe it's some sort of coping mechanism which people put in place so they can get through week to week and give themselves a reason to work their boring jobs. Question from Tom Elliott, when is the Amiga content coming, as that is where my gaming experiences really kicked in? Good question, Tom. Obviously, you submitted this question nearly a month ago, and I think since um, you submitted this question, I've actually uploaded two Amiga videos anyway, so if anyone wants to check them out, I've done an in-depth historical piece on the Amiga CD TV, and another one on the Amiga CD32 as well, both history pieces. I really want to do a video, obviously, on um, the Amiga microcomputers, both the A500 and the A1200 down the line. However, I feel that the history of both of those systems is so great and the library is so depthy. It's just a topic which is extremely hard to tackle for someone who's not spent a great deal of time playing the devices. So I would still feel I need to build up a lot more experience with those platforms before I take the plunge and cover those in detail. So that's the thing, I can only really cover platforms I know a lot about and I know there are people out there on the information superhighway throughout YouTube who know more about those systems than I do at present. So until I feel that my knowledge is in line with their knowledge, I won't cover those platforms quite yet, but they are in the pipeline and when I do get round to those sort of videos, they will be huge, as in the length will be huge and I will go into an outrageous amount of detail. That's my plan anyway, so stay tuned, it will happen eventually. Question from Riabolo. Could you please tell the story of how the Handhelds Around the World theme song came to be? Who wrote it and who performed it? Just in case you've never heard it before, I will play the song for everyone to hear now. Born in London in 86, a sad show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and goes round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting an and helps round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, hand hells round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. So in terms of the song itself, I wrote the lyrics to it. As you can hear, it's a parody version of um, Russell Crowe's uh, Fighting Round the World from South Park. Um, I can't remember how I actually came out of it in the first place. It's hard to think back, because that was a couple of years ago now. It was probably just through watching South Park, but no, I th I'll tell you what, first of all, I thought of a name, Handhelds Around the World, way before um, I thought of a Handhelds Around the World theme song. So, because I just thought of words that rhyme, like what rhymes with Handheld World, so that's how the title of that show was born. The theme song didn't come till quite a while after, probably a whole year after I'd already started producing those episodes. Um, it was either simply just putting two and two together, um, alpha waves in the brain, like watching Russell Crowe and hearing the title of my show and realising that uh, Russell Crowe travels around the world in these intro and I travel around the world in my show, so let's just put two and two together. Or maybe the idea wasn't from me in the first place, maybe someone suggested it in the comment section and I just ran with it. It's really hard um, to think about the ancestral roots of where the song came from. Now, in terms of who produced it, that's a really easy question to answer. There was once a small YouTuber I was a fan of um, named Mike, who had a little channel called Death Mountaineers, who kind of made game theory style content in a way. Um, a young American lad, he's been in a few of my videos in the past, and he told me he was a musician, so I told him my concept, and he kindly produced uh, the song for me. So, Mike from Death Mountaineers, he made the great song, so well done to you, Mike. Absolutely fantastic. In terms of what happened to Mike, he is now um, 
the fourth man brother at um, Treesicle, the Treesicle YouTube channel. He's one of their main editors, so Mike is now the editor for Treesicle. So he really has gone somewhere since producing my rather silly song. So yes, he's a big part of YouTube. Another question from Mark S. Hines. Do you have an interest in home brews or aftermarket games? Um, I kind of have to give you a double sort of answer with that one, yes and no. I suppose it's certainly something I would say I am interested in, but once again it's something I feel like I could put a lot more effort into exploring and learning more about before I can give you a proper answer on that question. Um, homebrew is an aftermarket game. I'm trying to think of any examples of stuff I've played. Obviously, Pier Solar on the Mega Drive. Um, I've not actually got a physical copy of that game. However, I did download and play it on the Wii U. Um, if it counts as a homebrew as well, I really enjoyed um, Pokemon Uranium, which was um, a fan-made Pokemon game which you can download on your PC. I, I had a lot of fun with that as well. And once again, it's just something I'd like to explore more in the future. So do I have an interest in it? Yes. Do I know much about it? No. It's one of those cases. So yes, perhaps once I go full time, I can cover more um, in regards to that field because it does sound interesting and it does definitely seems to be a niche there on YouTube which isn't perhaps being filled as much as many others. Another Tom Elliott question, will you ever make a BBC computer video as I started my gaming on this as a home computer but didn't really know much about it? Uh, once again Tom, this is kind of like the Amiga question as well. It's a system which I still feel I need to learn a lot about and gain a lot of experience with before I can cover it in any real detail. Again, it's a ridiculously popular platform in this country which a lot of people have had a lot of experience with and the only reason I've not got a great deal of experience with it is because of it's my age. Um, the BBC Micros had stopped being used in schools by the time I attended. I believe in my classroom in primary school I had some sort of Apple Mac computer. Computer. I don't know what happened to my voice there. And the only game I really remember playing on it for some reason, God knows why they had me playing this in school as well, because what a waste of time, was some sort of Arthur uh, point and click adventure game. So a bit like Discworld, but with Arthur, which was different, so in a British school of all things. Strange! So yeah, BBC Micros, we cover them down the line. I've also got a BBC Acorn as well, which a fan of this channel donated to me in the past and I'm looking to cover that system as well in the future. It's just chronologically working out when I'm going to get to these systems, but they will happen, as I said. Final question from Chris Weatherly, also known as Novabug, who um, runs a little YouTube channel all about the Amstrad CPC 464. He says, so I'm swallowing, my voice is starting to go now uh, via talking so long. Why do you think there are so many people today who get upset at the most trivial and meaningless remarks and jokes? So, uh, with regards to this question, I'm not quite sure whether or not this is a new thing, or whether it's something that's always been around, however we are just more aware of it today due to the way we communicate. Um, that of course being the internet and social media. We use it today more intensively than we have ever done so before. So whenever anyone says anything now, it's louder than it used to be. So whereas, for example, um, I used to make videos when I was a child, when I was like 15, 16, I would film something and then I'd show it to five or six of my friends. My family was lucky as well. So the biggest audience I'm gonna get for anything I say was, 10 people, whereas I make a video today, upload it to YouTube, and at least 10,000 people are usually going to see it. That's the difference. We can shout much louder today than we um, ever were able to before. So these people, who have always existed within our society, now have a platform where they never did before. Well, I'll give you a perfect example about these people who always existed. Let's just look at do you remember Save by the Bell? It doesn't get more bloody early 90s, late 80s than that. And um, one of the main characters within that show was your prototypical social justice warrior of today. Those people have always been around. That stereotype has always been prevalent. The only difference is the platforms and um, amount of attention they can get now. 
And the big difference as well is because of the internet, you can make a lot of money from outrage culture. Now, like huge amounts of money. So not only is the internet jumping on the outrage craze, but so are the newspapers, television, etc. Like look at that show, What's On In The Mornings with um, Piers Morgan. All they really do on there, well in that segment anyway, is find someone who said something outrageously stupid put them on the show so they can um, sp um, spout out their thoughts and opinions on it and then Piers Morgan will grill them and that's the entertainment people get is either enjoying watching Piers Morgan um, get his comeuppance or watching Piers Morgan rip someone apart, depend what side you sit on with regards to the political spectrum. So I don't believe outrage culture or social justice or people getting annoyed about trivial meaningless jokes as being anything new people just have allowed a platform to be offended on now that's my thoughts anyway nothing's really changed society's the same um, idiots just have um, a way of communicating now they never had once before so ladies and gentlemen um, thank you for submitting all of those fantastic questions to me well gentlemen today in this case by reading most of the names uh, yeah that was a lot of fun so if you too would like to submit questions for a future patreon q a then um, you can join my patreon page for as little as one dollar a month and um, as you um, pay in higher increments there are other opportunities on there as well for example if you pay ten dollars a month i will give you a shout out in the credits to every one of my members Main videos which I release every weekend so your name is going out there to over 10,000 people so if you've got a little YouTube channel then you might want to put your channel name at the end of my credits because um, you know hustling I suppose um, it's really difficult doing these out of character videos because I'm so used to doing them in character so I just have to say it might appear that I come across quite odd at times because Talking to this camera, I accidentally slip between just being Richard then slipping back into the Top Hat Gaming Man because that's the character I play multiple times per week on this channel and the same character I portrayed for over 10 years in the world of wrestling. It would be a bit like Hogan trying to get in front of a camera and not starting out with, well, let me tell you something, brother, mean Gene. It's just difficult. So right now, I don't really know who I am. You could be hearing from Richard. You could be hearing from a Top Hat Gaming Man. Who knows? Maybe they're just the same person anyway. Maybe it's not a gimmick. Maybe it's not a character. But thank you for submitting your fantastic questions and helping me build towards becoming a professional YouTuber, even if it's for a short time period. Let's see what happens. Cheerio!